Hello, my friends. How are you doing? My name is Olivio. I'm a YouTuber and the topic of image AI has taken over everything. And there's a good reason for why that is so popular. It is super easy to do that. Now everybody can just input a text and get out amazing images that are on par with masterworks, if you want to call it that. And that is a very deep impact into technology and culture. Image AI is one of the biggest inventions when it comes to art and culture and also the way we communicate with each other. A very important part of such an impact is the ease of use, because we have a lot of other technologies that can create amazingly beautiful images that are very, very sophisticated, but very complex at the same time. So for a normal person, an everyday person, this isn't really useful. And also for artists, it's useful, but it's very slow. So there is a very considerable time gap between having the idea and creating the end result. Now, if you have a technology that is extremely revolutionary and really changing the way we think and the way we do things, it has to be something that has a huge impact on everyday life that can be used right away. For example, if you think about photography, that had an extremely big change for basically everything we do. If you think about classic paintings, and they have been very similar for hundreds of years, because there was never a big question of should we maybe do it different, right? It was not a question of should it be for everybody out there. It was just for the royals and for the church and in a very similar style. It changed, of course, but not dramatically. Then we have photography coming around and the technology asking the question, what is an image actually? How hard should it be to take an image? Who should be able to make an image, a portrait, a landscape, any kind of thing? And suddenly everybody can do it with the click of a button. Of course, in the past, photography was more complex. The machines have been more expensive. It wasn't like for everybody as it is today, but it seeped into society in a very short time. And art changed dramatically in an even shorter time. So you can see from technology, a lot of change comes to culture, to art, to the way we understand the world. And of course, photography had a lot more impact than that because everything has to have a photo today or it hasn't happened. It is even part of our spoken language in the form of memes. You want to express something where words just don't cut it anymore. Well, you take either a photo or you take a GIF. So images are really important and the visual language that surrounds us, the expressiveness of images is even more important. So now for the everyday person, we do suddenly have a medium where they can come up with an idea as profane as might be and just type it and get a funny image out of that or a very serious image out of that and they can share it with their friends. Maybe put something on Etsy. The sophisticated artists that I know, they are extremely happy about this technology. They don't feel um, in any fear of this taking their jobs at all. And there is very good reason for that. Because after all, to be a good artist and to express something, to have ideas that are actually visionary and changing and impressive, you have to have a lot of experience and you have a lot of understanding how art works and how you create something that's actually good. This tool will make it even faster for you to create good things. So a classic thing, especially in the industries like gaming or movies, is that people are worked to their bone to create amazing ideas. And it takes a lot of time and like it takes a lot of work. Now they are super happy about technologies like this because they can now do in a day what usually would take a month and get a lot of ideas. Because another thing that is especially for artists, a big hurdle is that you need to be in the mood and have the like how to say the the brain resources, the creative resources inside of you to push out another idea and one idea more and another idea after that. And at some point, there's nothing left in your mind, right? It just needs to recharge. The eye doesn't need to recharge. You can set up a batch 
of a hundred or a thousand different text prompts and then just let the AI render through it overnight and come back the next day and have maybe a thousand or a couple thousand images that you can just sort through and then you can build on that. That is a very interesting technology, both for the everyday person and the expert in art creation. Both of them have really huge values from that. Now let's look a little bit at what AI actually creates when we talk about these images. So here you have one of these AIs, which is one of the most sophisticated when it comes to the quality of that image, and that is Midjourney. Midjourney is not very flexible in what you can do with it, because right now you can only input text, and then in a very limited way, you can also link images as an inspiration source but you can't render image to image. We will talk about that a little bit later. Let's look here at some different styles. You can see there's all kinds of different things in here from graphics. You can see here, this is a little bit of a Chibli style here, for example. This comes close to photography. You also have stuff like this, which is actually photorealistic. So you can't actually see the difference. Of course, if you zoom in, you're gonna see the difference. Here we have a cuddly, bunny in a 3D style, very colorful, really beautiful, and a lot more than that. You see all kinds of things from all kinds of backgrounds, even these kind of illustration, graphic designs can be done in all kinds of ways. You can also do book covers and like um, ink drawings. You see here, like there's a map, for example, here. So everything that comes to mind basically can be done. Here we have a product photo of, I would say this is meat, I guess. So that looks pretty good. And a lot of that on the first moment looks pretty amazing, right? All of that is very sophisticated and impressive and the colors are there and the contrast and the lighting and everything comes together in a very, very beautiful way. Now, when you start to look a little bit closer, you will probably realize that all of these images have certain problem. For example, here we can see it is really nice, but the shadows don't mix with the body. She has very thin arms and then the shadow doesn't stop. It goes until her body. And over here, there's even more shadow that doesn't really make sense. And there's shadow on both sides for some reason, even though we can see that the light comes from the top left. So this AI and all AIs at the moment have the problem that they will make mistakes. Another thing you can see here is the hands. AI has huge problems getting the hands right at the moment. The faces work beautifully and there's even face restoration AIs who help you to get even better results, but hands right now are not so great. But overall, you can see that still the results are pretty amazing and most of them don't even require the hands. And most of them are in an artistic way where it doesn't really matter if the shadow or the light or other things are a little bit off because it looks like it is intentional, like we are used to from modern art. Here's another element that might be interesting for the experts in the arts is that you can't change minute details. So when we look at the prompt from this, you can see it's not even a very large prompt. We have here, it says Surrealism Tarot card plus The Fool, Avant-Garde, High Chroma, Fine Details, Naoto, Hattori and Picasso cover art. All right. So none of that has anything to do with this image other than that everything of that is somehow here in a certain way. But none of this describes that card. If you would describe this to a friend, they surely wouldn't think about that card. So this means with AI, you have a lot of randomness and the AI gives you kind of what it thinks you want to have. Well, when I say what you think, I don't mean in an intelligent way, like we think about stuff, just in a way that the AI reacts to things, right? So if you say, this is really cool, but actually in here, I wanna have the planet Mars. Not really possible right now. You can do this with um, in painting. So there is a certain way where you can do that. But if you want to do this a lot and in very specific ways, like you say, okay, I would draw this here a little bit different, for example, or I would use a different material or stuff like that. 
that is not really something AI can do right now. So this specificness, and this this is the huge difference if you compare this directly to an artwork, you will see that this looks very good, but in comparison to an actual artwork, you see that this has a lot less purpose and a lot less clarity in how and why things are applied in a certain way, where the shadows are and the highlights and how the colors are used and how all of the elements in the image work together to create the overall expression and this kind of artistic beauty that where when we look at an artwork and say, wow, this is very impressive. This everything feels very authentic. It feels organic. It feels like it belongs. And here it's kind of like that, but not really. All of the elements are not a hundred percent there. When we when we scroll back up here, when we look at this at this armor here, you can also see when you look at the complete armor, this looks great. It looks really beautiful. But then if you zoom into that, you see that all of these ornaments don't make sense at all. They look beautiful. It has this kind of dreamlike quality where you think you see something, but when you actually look, it's not there anymore. It's kind of a mirage, right? You see a really sophisticated, very ornamented um, armor that is black with some gold on top of it. And then you zoom in. And it's just a mess of lines and shapes and it still looks good, but it isn't anything specific. But for a professional artist, the good thing here is you can come up with this idea through the AI and create a lot of different variations from that. And then later on, you go in and you create the actual details for that, right? So in that sense, it still makes a lot of sense to use these AIs. There's two questions a lot of people are asking. One of them is, is this remixing images that are already out there? And the second one is, is this actually art or is it just something? But art needs to have effort and work in it. Now let's go for the first question. It's not remixing images in the sense of like a DJ using samples or like sampling other vinyls, other music tracks, and then just smashing them together into something new. This is not how AI works. An easy way to understand how AI works is if you think about how you learned about the world. So what we do to train our brains is basically that we look at things, we look at images, we look at all kinds of stuff around us, and then we associate these things with words. And so in our life, we have our parents and teachers as trainers to tell us, okay, this is good and that is not so good. The parents say, hey, draw a bear. And then we draw a bear and they say, no, it's not a bear. It's a cat. You draw the cat. It's not a bear. Try again. And they show us, okay, it has to be different like this. It's not about specific images of bears. And of course, there's different kinds of bears out there. It is about understanding these are the kind of features you would associate with a bear. So if I roughly draw these features, it starts to look more and more like a bear. At that point, I'm not coping any famous artworks, even though I might have seen them with bears in them. I draw them from memory, from all of the images, from all of the experiences that I have, right? So we need to find a connection between a lot of impressions we had over time and then words that we can associate with these impressions. So this basically is how this text to image AI works. Of course, the actual process is a lot different and it's a lot more complicated. But the main takeaway from this is this isn't just searching images on Google and then smashing them together to create a new image. It has downloaded millions, sometimes billions of images to analyze them and associate them with words. And then basically it draws from memory, if you will. Now, the second question is, is any of that art? And there is a very simple answer to that, I would say. First of all, AI is a machine. It's a tool like a photo camera. So a machine doesn't automatically create art. That is not specifically how that works. At the same time, everything can be called art because we as humans design what art is. There's nobody out there other than us who actually cares about art. We don't know any other intelligent species like us who can create art. 
and animals certainly don't care about art so we are the only ones who can decide this is art and you can certainly do this with found footage which is a specific form of art called the ready-made you can buy something in a store and say and now this is art and suddenly becomes art it becomes art because of the reasoning of the purpose behind that the way why you would make this art and put it on a pedestal and ask a question with that so somehow the existence of this piece of this work of this image whatever it is and the question you are asking in combination with each other makes it art so you always need a person to say well this is art this might be the person who creates the artwork this might be the person who chooses it as an artwork it might also be the person who finds it to be an artwork like the consumer so you can absolutely make the point that you can randomize the output of an ai and just put these works on a website as handy covers as t-shirt prints as any kind of other form of design you want to buy and some people are probably going to buy it and some people are probably going to fall in love with the output because it is after all very beautiful and at that point we have to ask also ourselves who does actually decide at what point what can be called art and at what point can art have an impact on culture and society does there have to be a thought in the work before that and this is something that I found personally very interesting when talking with other artists. Because when you go to a museum, often you don't know much about the artist. There might be everything lost, even the name. It just says, painting of a woman by an unknown artist. Well, at that point, it might just exist. We have absolutely no information about that work who did it, why they did it, where it came from, when it was created. There is some association in regards to other artworks and we can certainly analyze the materials to see how old that artwork is. But everything else at that moment is lost. But still, it is a valid artwork and still it might have a huge impact on the history of art. So the same goes for these kind of images where there might be nothing behind that but at the same time there's everything behind that because these AIs have been trained on our output on our art so they have analyzed all of our visual language over the time over the centuries they understand more about art than most artists do and then they create pictures from that that are a culmination of all of these artistic creative processes to output something that looks like it and of course you can have now an endless conversation about is this an original is this an expression does it have a meaning but also at the end of the day the question is who cares if someone wants to buy that as a poster or as a print or any kind of thing use it as a wallpaper on their desktop why wouldn't they why would they have to ask hey this has to be from a human and i know this sounds very contradictory at that moment that you would say no it has to be from a person otherwise it's not like it's not real it's not the real thing but you still enjoy it you still like what you're seeing and this actually brings us to the next important point what does the artist actually have to do to create the art because this is also a very big argument well art needs skill first of all we have already ruled that out with the ready-made so artists don't need skill they only need the idea and have to combine it with a work and then it can create art from that process but the more important question is how far can i go beyond the art we have right now with a technology that frees me from the process so when you think about it and you have to paint a landscape painstakingly over weeks and you take a photo that takes a split second and that photo maybe even looks better than the painting you see that you have a process that takes very little effort but at the same time has an amazing output now here we have a similar thing but the huge difference here is that this machine is basically a canvas that can be filled with anything but also a canvas that speaks back to you in these different forms of art so what that means is that suddenly you are an artist but you're completely freed 
from your artistic skill, from your technical skill, from your cultural background, even from the epoch that you're in, or from the things that you're able to experience. Because I have a lot of people in my community, they say, I have been an artist for all my life, and now I can't move my hands anymore. I'm too old. I can't do this and that anymore. I can't go outside anymore. But now I've found AI and I can go back and create artworks and be creative again. So that is one argument that is really important and for me very touching. But also what I see is that a lot of people use this technology to go beyond the limitations they have. Because of course the day only has 24 hours, right? So if you want to create something new and you want to try a lot of ideas and you need to go through all of that process, now this takes a lot of that process away. And you can just hyperspeed through that process, through all of that work and arrive at new ideas, at new concepts, at new outputs much faster and with a much higher quality. So that is very, very impressive. So at the end, the question is actually not how much effort do you need so you can call it art, but how much can this take away so you can focus on the other things that are more important and that make you more creative? How many different artistic languages does this allow you to speak and dive into all kinds of different genres, techniques, backgrounds, histories, cultural styles, all these kind of things. And you can basically artistically remix them with the AI in that creation process. Let's talk about the different options we have for image generation AIs. One of the most sophisticated and most popular ones right now is Midjourney AI, and they are known for their very, very sophisticated outputs. Especially, they are known for a very artistic expression, very beautiful color choices, composition choices, artistic methods, and how everything flows very nicely together. As you can see in these examples here, that all look very good. And what I found personally with Midjourney is that most of the results you get back look good enough to be works of their own. So eight out of 10 pictures actually are nice and flawless and look really good, but they might not specifically be what you want in that moment. So you still need a lot of experimentation with that. The way Midjourney works right now is through Discord. They are working on a dedicated website where you can use the website as the interface. Right now, you are in a chat with the Midjourney bot. You write these little texts here. They are called prompts. And then at the end of it, you write the prompt commands. They start with minus minus. And then, for example, followed by AR. And in this case, two by three. This is the ratio. And then minus minus test p that is the render method that is applied here so on midjourney we have a choice between different render methods so we have the render model version 1 version 2 version 3 and then right now they also test other methods which is minus minus test minus minus creative minus minus test p and you can combine minus minus test with minus minus creative to get something that is closer to version 3 but you can also use minus minus test on its own and minus minus test P on its own. The P stands for photographic. So this is for more photorealistic results. If you want to get started with Midjourney, I suggest to you to get better results faster. You go to the community feed. You can see here it's under midjourney.com. And here on the left side, you click here on that icon to get to the community feed. The good thing is that all of the used prompts here are completely open. So when you mouse over them, you see a preview of that prompt being used. And when you click on that image, you can scroll down to see the full prompt and the resolution. And when you go here to these three dotted line, you click on that and you go to copy command, not copy prompt, copy command, because this will include the prompt and also the prompt commands, which are these minus minus additions to the end of the prompt that I showed you before. Now, 
In Midjourney, you can upload images into the Discord chat and then link them so they are used as a reference, but they are only used as an inspiration right now so you cannot have an image just change into another style like for example having a portrait of you and then having it turned into a style of a watercolor painting that does not work with midjourney also one of the downsides if you want to call it that with midjourney is that this is not open source there's a team that is dedicated is working on that it's a company and that means the progress is slower and they decide what they want to have so you only get like a voice to say i want that feature but if it ever comes you can't really tell and because of that the options what you can do with midjourney right now are rather limited this brings us to our second ai which is called stable diffusion this is an open source project and as far as i know over 20000 developers are working on this project it's pretty impressive and this means there is very rapid development. Now, the graphical output of Stable Diffusion is not as good as with Midjourney. And you can see that when you go over to lexica.art because this is a collection of Stable Diffusion works. Again, when you scroll through here, you can click on the individual images. You get the full prompt, but in this case, you also get the seed you get the guidance scale and the dimension so you can work with that. You're still not going to get the same result, but you can see here several examples for that prompt and you have a good idea what has been involved in creating that image. But you can also see that for a lot of these images, the results are not as sophisticated. There are more mistakes in here. Like for example, if you look at the facial structure, at these fish eyes that you often get, and in this case, these are good results. Often you get, for example, two heads in there or the character is cut off on the side so it's not centered in the image or the head is sticking out over the edge of the image. So this happens quite often with stable diffusion. On the other hand, the huge benefit here is if you have a strong computer, you can install this locally, run it on your own GPU, it should be an NVIDIA GPU because they are more supported with the Stable Diffusion project. You can also run it on an M1 Apple computer. And for the AMD chips, I think there is a solution, but I'm not 100% sure. But the good thing here is, as you can see, there is a lot of things you can adjust. Up here, you write the prompt. Down here, you write the things you don't want to have in your image. And then here you can decide on the sample steps, on the sampling method, which will give you very different results than the width and the height. And you can see here again, low resolution. Here you have an automated restore face in here. You have a tiling method. This means that the result will be a seamless tile afterwards. And you have a high res fix. That means that it will first render a low resolution image and then upscale it to a high resolution image to give you a better result. Another good thing for stable diffusion is that you can batch this. So you can see here, I can have a batch size of eight and then a batch count of 16. So this eight count will be repeated 16 times, which means you can go for a walk or a coffee and have the AI create these images for you. And then afterwards, you can simply select the best ones. There's a lot more settings in here. We have the seed, but one more thing I want to show you is the scripts we have down here. For example, you can have a prompt matrix and you can also have rendering the prompts from a text file, which means you can just have hundreds of prompts that you let render overnight. And you can have an X epsilon plot where you test out these settings automated in the range you want them to be. Here I have a X epsilon prompt that exchanges individual words inside of my prompt. So you can see here that it also creates a grid for me where, for example, my prompt is polar bear in snow landscape and I'm replacing the word polar and the word snow. So you can see here for the result, I have a polar bear, brown bear, koala bear, and I have them in a snow landscape 
in a summer landscape and in an autumn landscape so I can test out these different ideas, but also I can automate them in case I need all of these options for a project. So this is very, very work effective. Another thing you can do with stable diffusion is image to image rendering. In that case, it means you have an image as an input. You can write a prompt up here. You can set the settings down here. And in this case, we have a denoising strength, which means that when I go to one, this will only take the prompt into consideration. When I go to zero, it will only take the image into consideration. So nothing changes. So on this scale, I can try to figure out what best fits with the image. So in this case, you can see that I take this photo and I want to turn it into a pencil drawing by Alphonse Mucha. So this is the end result. You can experiment a lot more with that, but you can see that the composition is similar. We do have the woman and the lake and the mountains in the background, but now it's in a different style. The woman doesn't look the same, so you can play around until you get something that looks very similar. But for this, it's good enough if you just want to have the same composition. What you can also do with stable diffusion is in painting. I have a brush here so I can mask out the eyes, write my prompt, set my settings down here, and then you see that this is only replacing the eyes in the image. So this can be used in a lot of different ways, not just for replacing individual parts of the image, but also, for example, to do a kind of photo bashing where you start with a rough idea and then go in step by step, part by part to replace these elements of the image with things you desire more. So you build up a scene over time. This can also be used for deep faking and face replacement. I made a video about that too. It's an interesting method, but also worrisome, of course. When we go to extras, we find the upscaling where we again have different methods. You can also apply two upscalers at the same time and you can fix the face with two different methods again. This will give you an upscale of up to four times and the results are pretty amazing from this upscaler. Again, you can also use this with your own photos. Another thing Stable Diffusion allows is textual inversion. And what that means is you can train a small part of the AI on your own images. So if you have an image of yourself or if you have images of a different artistic style that you would like to have as the base for the AI, so the AI understands what you mean by that, you can train a small part of the AI for that. So when you go to text to image again, this will make the images in that style or create a face of that specific person. And of course, you can imagine how valuable this can be to train the AI on your own artistic style and then have the AI output sketches, ideas and concepts with your artistic style. Another even more sophisticated method for this is called Dream Booth. Here you get much deeper, much more realistic results. You can see here we have the input images. And then after the training is finished, you can see that you get outputs of that dog that look like that dog, but in different kinds of situations. So this is extremely impressive, but again, also artistically very helpful. If you, for example, have an actor or if you have a special character that you want to have in different images, you can train the AI to do that and then create that afterwards. And because a lot of that process is automated, you get amazing results, but at the same time, saving a lot of time. Now the stable diffusion install I showed you before is called automatic 1111. It's free to download. I have a video on how to install this on your computer. And when you look in here, you will see there are a lot of different things you can do with that AI. Again, here is the in painting idea where you replace a part of the image with different kinds of trees or here where you put a house into a tree. But again, you can also do these kind of rasters here where you try different methods together with each other. So in this case, you can see that illustration is tested in cinematic lighting. So you have a street scene only with cinematic lighting, only with illustration, and then an illustration with cinematic lighting. So this 
again is really good for automation of creative ideas and testing different concepts. Here you see another interesting method of that where different artist names or artist styles are tested against different CFG scales, which means how strong the prompt is taken into consideration. So that means by testing this automatically and you can easily render over 100 images in one of these grids, you can find the sweet spot for what kind of name, what kind of method, what kind of subject and setting for the scales gives you the best results. Another thing that is very impressive that you can use with stable diffusion is called loop back. So the way this works is that you enter your prompt and you have, for example, here a crude starting image like a drawing. Now this is rendered with an image to image input using that image creating that output. Then in the second step it is using this image now as the input creating that output. So this is where the loop comes. Always the last step is used as the input for the next step. So this can involve more and more over time. Now this method, to be honest, is very tricky and this is a very cherry picked result where it goes from the crude painting to a really beautiful anime illustration. I didn't get these kind of results, but still with loopback you get really interesting, very amazing results. So you should absolutely give that a try. Another version of stable diffusion is called a deforum. You can use this on the Google call up, but you can also use this as a local install, as you can see local version. Now what this does is even more amazing because you can create videos and you can create them from a text input, but you can also use image to image. When you use image to image, this is using an MP4 file as a video. It's splitting it up into the individual JPEGs and using these JPEGs to create the image to image render. Afterwards, it's combining these JPEGs again into a MP4 so you can download a finished video. Another thing you can do here that is equally impressive is that you can set up different prompts at different times of the animation. So you can say render the first 50 images with the prompt A and then afterwards from 51 to 100 use my second prompt. And more than that, as you can see here with this animation, you can move in different directions while the prompt is rendered. So you can zoom into the image, you can move in different axes, you can rotate basically the virtual camera and by that basically flying through that animation space. Now you can see here that in a temporal coherence, this is not specifically great. You can see here the details are changing a lot. They are not sticking together from image to image in this kind of random method. And even if you have a video input, there might be a lot of changes in there. But on the one side, I would say this is very good because this shows you that this is an AI image and this is a style that is at the moment very popular. But on the other hand, if you just want to have a style change or render a face over an actor or stuff like that, you might have a bit of a problem with this method. But still, this is one of the most interesting methods right now to create interesting videos that go beyond anything we have seen so far. So this is a method a lot of artists use right now. It's used for music videos and it's used also for other animations in advertisements, stuff like that, because you can do things you have never seen before in that way. I created a simple music video that you can watch online and it took me only eight hours to find the scenes, cut them to the music and then animate them with stable diffusion to these drawing painterly styles. There is also DALI 2 and I have to admit I don't have much experience with it. I tested it for a bit. And the results are nice, but I found personally as an artist that they are often not as inspiring and don't have the same artistic expression you especially find with Mid Journey. 
DALI 2 is very good at creating very realistic results that often look very correct in the different details. It can also do in painting. So you can see here where it changes details in the image and replaces different elements. For example, here you can see that the dock is changing in the image. But personally, for me, these realistic results weren't as interesting because I want to use AI as a tool for inspiration and to give me something, to give me impressions that I can't do myself. So if this is too realistic and if it just looks like a photo that I could take myself with a smartphone, why not just take the photo with the smartphone? So if you compare this output to what you see on Midjourney or what you see on Stable Diffusion, I just like these results a lot better. Now let's also talk a little bit about the artistic use and potential of this technique from my perspective in this case. So personally, I think that the AI image generation is as big a cultural and technical revolution as computers and digital art has been. And this is now unlocked in a much bigger way with image AI, because now you can create any kind of image beyond your reach before from where you can go, what you can do, what your skill is. All of this is now opened up like a big flower and you can just look at it and you can just enjoy it and you can do with it whatever you want. Now, there are a lot of interesting concepts out there where, for example, one of the ideas is, well, this takes away any kind of personal artistic creativity and ingenuity and vision. You just like type a text and you're done. That is not true. No matter what the tool is, you still need to be a really, really, really good artist to do something worthwhile with it. You can create a million pictures and none of that pictures will be as powerful and impactful as a work of one person who creates a masterpiece, maybe by chance, maybe by skill, but there is a huge difference between those. The other thing is that people say, well, AI can only do what has happened in the past. That is right if you think about uh, the models you can download and they have already been trained. But there's two arguments that speak against that kind of position. The first is, this is how your brain literally works. You only know about the world, what you have seen in the past. You don't have a future vision in your mind. You don't have anyone who was back in the Renaissance and make techno music. That's just not a thing. But when we look at history, you will always see that technology had a much, much bigger impact in the change of how we see ourselves, the philosophies about the world and how we create art than all of the artistic thinking and philosophy around it. Because we need something for the brain to work on. And these new technologies, they show us dimensions and ways to do things we have never seen before. Processes can inspire our brain, our thinking to do more things in a different way. But more than that, and this is really interesting, especially when you look at the history of art, is that technology has always freed up people to do other things with new technology. And so you will find when you look, for example, at the history of painting, that just the invention of industrialized oil paint color that you can buy in glasses or in tubes has enabled artists to go outside. Before that, they had to mix up the pigments and the oil and all other ingredients to make the oil color and then try to have the color look the same as last time. And then suddenly industrial color comes around. You can go outside in the landscape and just draw wherever you are. And this is where you suddenly see these paintings that paint anything out there. Artists would not do that before. So the liberation of an artist has nothing to do with being lazy or being unskillful. It has everything to do with freeing artists from something that is so well known, so well understood that it's kind of unnecessary. And now a machine can do it for you like the oil paint or like the picture in the camera. But now you can go out and instead of thinking, how can I paint this and spend hours painting that landscape, you can go out there and you can take 
millions of pictures and you can really improve that craft and show th people things they have never seen before in a way they have never seen before. And this is what's happening right now. When you go to the Mid Journey community feed, you will see a lot of pictures that you have seen a million times before because they simply copy the ideas that have already been there. But then over time, and especially because you can train the AI with your own styles, with your own images, with your own words, this can change into something completely different. And now we have a process where the art is pumping out a lot of images and finding things in that image, in the technology, in what you can do with AI by using AI, but also by abusing AI in ways it wasn't meant to function to create completely new things. And even right now, you can see things that are so different and so mind changing that um, you already see new horizons coming up and you see already new artistic worlds opening up. One of the things I like most is because so many people can do it and these people have not to ask for permission. They don't have to ask for a diploma or anything else. They just go out there, they experiment, they do whatever they like. And no matter what their background, no matter what their education, they come up with new styles of art, of music, of design, of movies, of all these kind of things. And the old creators might think, oh, what is this? This isn't art. And the new creators might think, wow, I didn't even know I can do that. And the next generation think, why didn't you ever try to do that? Because this is so amazing. And this is this evolution of the artistic process. And I think AI is one of the most important elements to free up, to enable and to empower people to unlock their creativity and do whatever they want and go far beyond whatever we have seen until now in images and art. Now, lastly, for the closing argument, because a lot of people think they might lose their job over this. I trained all of my life and now this can be done in a second. But the thing with technology is with every step, it gets more complex. It opens up new opportunities, new jobs, new directions of what you can do. So more people will have jobs, not less. Of course, some jobs will fall away. Of course, a lot of people will need to learn these new techniques and try to adapt them into their workflow so they can still be relevant in the industry. But you can see right now how this is becoming so much more complex and enable so much more people to do things that this will spawn gigantic industries. And I know personally people from these industries who say that these image AIs are a blessing for them because it's a really amazing shortcut. They can prepare huge projects and show them for the game design, for the movie design with absolutely amazing renders and do the stuff they did in a month now in a couple of days. And one of the things to absolutely keep in mind with AI is that this is a canvas that can talk back to you. You have a conversation with the canvas where you say, how about this idea? And the canvas says, well, it would look like this, but how about we try that? And so you go backward and forward and this keeps the creative chooses flowing and the AI will present to you thousands of different ideas. So while your creativity needs to replenish after a certain time, the AI can just pump out idea after idea and you are left with the job of selecting them and innovating on top of them. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and check out my channel if you want. I have a ton of videos about AI art on there. See you soon and thanks for watching. Bye.